Um, and welcome back to uh, our next interview on uh, Horrorcon UK. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Daryl Buxton. I'm uh, uh, um, a uh, horror critic going back years. If you, uh, if you read mags like Sam Hain and Jallo Pages um, back in the 80s and 90s, you might know my name from those. Um, uh, and I've been uh, very kindly asked to uh, um, uh, handle some of the guest interviews this weekend. And the first one I'm going to do, um, uh, we're going to welcome to the stage someone who's a real icon of the genre. A stuntman, actor, author, producer, and if my research is to be believed, a true life ghost hunter. And um, hopefully we'll find out more about that um, in our sessions uh, with the man uh, today and tomorrow. Um, uh, I'm only five foot six, as you can see, and so for the next half hour or so, I'm prepared to be very, very intimidated by the sheer bulk, not to mention the excessive talents of our special guest. Horror Hounds, please big, give a big welcome to the cinema's greatest Jason Voorhees, Mr. Kane Honor. Interesting venue for a panel. Yeah, new, but, uh, new to me as well. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll discover it together. I feel like uh, I don't know if you ever saw something I did in I think it was 1989. I did an appearance on a talk show in full costume, in character. It was the Arsenio Hall show, and they had a live audience, kind of like this. And he brought me out again. I'm in character. And uh, he said, you know, I want you to do the interview in character. I said, well, Arsenio, you realize I don't speak. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. So I went out, sat on the couch, stared at him. He asked me questions. I stared at him. Uh, it was pretty funny. It's on YouTube if you ever want to take a look. But uh, the interesting thing was that he told me ahead of time that I, he said, I know it sounds stupid, but... I'm actually afraid of your character. And that is probably the wrong thing to say to me. So, because he said, I'm afraid of your character, so when you're on the show, please don't fuck with me. So, obviously I fucked with him as much as I could. At the end, I go to shake his hand to say thank you, and I pulled him towards me and he freaked out. So, it's, uh, it was fun. Uh, I haven't really done much of anything in costume other than the movies and uh, it was kind of interesting to do that so there's a lot of uh, crazy uh, things on YouTube usually of me doing something but not in costume so uh. okay Kane um, uh, I'd like to start here by uh, discussing your day job if you like you the meat and potatoes of what you do you work as a stuntman why are you um, sitting so far away from me? <laughs> there you go. How's that? Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't want you to read the questions over my shoulder. Uh, yeah, um, yes, I've been a stuntman for uh, almost 40 years. Um, I am now 61. And I've uh, uh, been doing stunts for, in, in January, it'll be exactly 40 years. And I don't know if you, you guys know, sorry, you guys, I'm trying to make sure I engage you too. Um, my first year in the stunt business, I got burned doing a fire stunt, almost killed me. Um, six months after officially entering the stunt business. So not a great way to start a career, but um, it made me appreciate life, if nothing else, much more than... I had at the time because when it's almost taken from you then you think you know what this is pretty cool that I'm around so I, I I think I changed for the better as a result of being burned but it was a terrifically painful experience and I didn't have proper care and stuff but the very first 
thing I ever did as a professional stuntman was a TV show called Emergency. And I played, ironically, a person that had been burned uh, on an oil refinery tower. And that was in January. In July of that year, I got burned for real. So it wasn't a great way to start a career, but <clears throat> I never once considered not continuing with stunts. I loved it so much and I just loved the whole business that it was part of my motivation to get out of the hospital and get back to work. And at the time I wasn't sure if I'd do fire stunts again because of what had happened. But eventually I did that um, also and ended up specializing in fire stunts because it's a, it's a very tricky stunt to do and it's not one of those stunts that you just say, ah, fuck it, I'm crazy, I'll just go out and do it. Which, by the way, I always find it funny when people brag about how many bones they've broken doing stunts. Because from my point of view, if you're bragging about breaking bones doing stunts, then you're bragging about fucking up. <laughs> because the point is to do a stunt successfully, not just not give a shit what happens. So I find it funny that, you know, people like Hal Needham back in the day used to brag about, I've broken 212 bones, and I, I wasn't impressed by that. Doesn't mean you're any better of a stuntman. Just means you didn't do it as well. <clears throat> um, and I don't know, if, if, does anyone know the number, approximate number of bones that I've broken? I've been an athlete, all in school and high school and played all the sports and then 40 years of doing stunts uh, do you think you could guess how many bones I've broken in my life just say a number 25. oh I heard the correct answer out there zero I have never broken a bone and if I, I you know I'm that's what I'm proud of because I've done some stuff where as I'm on the ground, I'm saying, okay, I think this time something's broken. And sure enough, nothing. Uh, and I think it's more genetic than anything because my mom, uh, when she was 82, I think, 81 or 82, she fell down a flight of brick stairs about uh, 12 steps and tumbled down badly and didn't break a bone. So that's pretty impressive. And uh, I think I just have good, solid genetic structure from her. Um, and the burn is really the only time I've been seriously hurt. And I say seriously because if you can go to work the next day, then I don't consider you being injured. I mean, you may be sore as hell or whatever, but if you can work the next day, it's not an injury. A lot of other people would say, would consider some of the stuff that's happened as an injury, but um, I don't really, you know, it's all relative. And now, because of being burned, um, I don't really, ha I have a very high threshold of pain because once you go through being burned and I, I received terrible care for the burn for the first four months so I went through way more pain than I should have so now you know I have I've had minor surgeries done my shoulders operated on hernia and stuff and I don't get put out for any of that no anesthetic because I don't find it necessary just a local anesthetic wherever the surgery is but um, you know I think people overuse that stuff so but it's been a fun career in stunts, and I never anticipated when I started in the stunt business, never thought I'd ever sign an autograph, first of all, because stunt people are typically in the background. And you have actors <clears throat> very often taking credit for something you did. Happens all the time. So that's just part of the business. You never anticipate being um, known for much other than a successful stunt person. 
So I think because of that background uh, and that attitude going into the film business, I appreciate the fact that people do want me to sign stuff now because I know how lucky I am. I mean, when I was first asked to play Jason by John Beekler, who directed the first movie, uh, I felt an incredible honor. This is a character that's been around for six films already. So it's known around the world. Now imagine how amazing it felt to know that I was going to be the guy playing the character now. It, it was f phenomenal. It really, I couldn't get over the fact that I was going to be Jason. So because of that, I wanted to put everything I possibly could into performing the character instead of just walking through it. And, you know, I, I wanted to enjoy it and put my whole heart and soul into it so that the performance would be as good as it could be. And I guess, you know, fortunately, based on that first one I did, then I did three more films after that as the character. So people liked what I did, and I just loved doing it. So, uh, you know, some people go into acting because they want to be famous. And those are typically the ones that end up being assholes to work with. <clears throat> That's just what I've seen. The people that didn't expect it and it happens appreciate it more and are more, you know, genuine people and don't think they're big shots and stuff, so. Okay, now from what you've said there, Kane, you were clearly a fan of the Friday the 13th series already before you got involved in it. Um, uh, what particularly impressed you about, uh, if anything, about the guys who played Jason before you? And did you take anything from them or when, when you came to, to play the part yourself, was it a purely new creation for you? Well, I did, you know, know all the previous films. I had watched them as a fan. Uh, and then when I got the job, before we started filming, I watched them all again. Because I, even though I was a new guy playing the character, I didn't want it to be so completely different from the previous because, you know, fine, I've played the character four times, but I'm not the only guy that has played the character. So I wanted to maybe take little parts of previous performances that I liked uh, I, I thought in particular CJ in part six did a good job. He's a good buddy of mine now and Ted White I think did a good job in part four. So I kind of uh, kept that in mind when performing but the, the thing that I found that when I would watch Jason in previous movies if he was standing and staring at someone he almost looked like a mannequin. So I thought, what, what can I do to make Jason still look threatening even though he's just staring at somebody? So that's when I came up with the breathing thing. And instead of just staring like this, it looks scary enough, but then when you're doing that, I thought, when I looked in the mirror while I was in the costume, I thought, oh shit, that looks like he's about to do something <laughs> horrible. And just like he's ready to explode. So those kind of things I just added to what I had seen in the past. And, and you know, and then <clears throat> in, doing, in doing the films, there would be things that uh, once I played the character once and I was doing it a second time, I felt I had a little more say-so in what the character should do and shouldn't do. So, in part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan, there was a scene written in the script where shortly after Jason looks at the billboard and recognizes the mask on the billboard, turns around, he walks away from there and sees a dog threatening him, barking at him, and he kicks the dog. And I thought, no, that doesn't feel like something Jason would do. He's a cruel motherfucker to people. <coughs> but I never saw him, you know, purposely harming an animal. I would think he would identify with an animal. So I told the director, 
we're not doing that scene. He said, what? It's in the script. And I said, Jason wouldn't do that. And I, I, that was a risky thing to say at the time because it was only my second time playing the role, but I didn't think it fit. And eventually when we didn't shoot that and the director realized, you know what, you're right. It was gratuitous and, you know, I'm not against gratuitous violence, obviously, <laughs> but it just didn't seem <clears throat> to fit the, the character, so we didn't do it. And he agreed later that that was the right choice. And, you know, later on in one of the movies, I think maybe it was Jason Goes to Hell, the director comes over to me and says, okay, so now when Jason, when the girl runs out of the house at the beginning, Jason's going to come running out. And, well, oh, wait a minute. He's going to what? He's going to come running out. I said, no, he's not, actually. Uh, I don't think Jason ever runs. I know it's ridiculous that he always catches everybody even though he doesn't run. They're ripping ass through the woods. He's walking, still catches them. And I always said, you know, a couple reasons for that. These are Jason's woods, so he knows the shortcuts. And they're always going to trip and fall, give me a chance to catch up. So even, even if it didn't make sense, I just, once I started playing the character, which is part seven, I think Jason was more of a zombie, a kind of a dead walking Jason. And I just didn't see him running. Maybe if I had played the character earlier on when he was really a human, then I would have felt differently. But by the time I did it, I just never thought Jason would run. Which, interesting because, sorry, you asked me a question, I go on and on forever, but... That's why you're here. <laughs> uh, you guys know that there's a video game coming out soon. Friday the 13th video game. Yeah, I'm very happy to. They asked me to do the motion capture for Jason for the game, and I was honored that they felt that. The, the producer said, there's no other person that we would want to do the motion capture. So, uh, so while doing the motion capture, I was put into a little bit of a dilemma because I was told that <clears throat> you're going to be able to play as different versions of Jason, but I'm going to do the motion capture for all, all of the Jason moves in the game. But you can play as part seven, as I believe part two, part eight, I think, and maybe even uh, part three, for sure, part three. So the producer, one of the guys ma mainly directing the, the motion capture said, now here's a little bit of a situation here. I know you refused to run as Jason, but now what if someone is playing as part three Jason, where Jason did run in the movie? And I was like, oh shit, that's right. So I actually, during the motion capture, did some shots running because that's how Richard Brooker portrayed the character in part three. And if you're part three Jason, you should be able to run. So uh, it was kind of an odd thing that I never thought I would run as Jason, but I did. And it's because, you know, that's what he did. And if you're playing that version, I think you need to keep it consistent. Okay, now I'm sure you in the audience have got loads of questions for Mr. Holler, so uh, uh, we'll give you an opportunity now to, uh, to ask anything that you'd like. So, anyone in, in the crowd? One in the front row there, yes. Hi again, I just wanted to ask, you've played Jason and Victor Crowley, is there any other horror icon you'd love to do and why? Yes, um, you know, those two, of course, I love playing both of them. I hope we're not done with the Hatchet series yet, but you never know. Uh, I did do a bunch of scenes in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 as Leatherface, so a lot of the action scenes were me uh, as that character, so that kind of counts. And I did the one shot in Jason Goes to Hell 
where Freddy's glove comes out of the ground and grabs the hockey mask and pulls it in at the end of the movie. That was actually me doing that in the Freddy glove and the Freddy sweater sleeve, so I technically did one shot as Freddy. <laughs> uh, so, there's one major one missing, and it's a character I always would have loved to have played, which is Michael Myers oh, in the Halloween right. movies. Yeah. Wouldn't he do a hell of a job as well? <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, it's very similar to Jason, but I would still make it different. Uh, I think Tyler did a fine job in in Rob's Halloween movies, uh, but that's that's the one I'd. Uh, I mean, I technically played Michael, but not in a Halloween movie. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Adam Green's uh, shorts that he makes, like the scary sleepover that I did with him. And there's a, a short with myself and Joel David Moore, who. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> Uh, Joel David Moore was in the uh, first Hatchet movie, and uh, he's a, a hilarious <laughs> actor, and he did a shot, by the way, in that first Hatchet movie that I never thought somebody would do. There's a scene where Victor, I tackle him in the graveyard, and I'm on top of him, and we're face to face, and I scream and all this gooey liquid shit comes out of my mouth and goes into his mouth as he's screaming. And I couldn't believe that he was willing to do that. They put a mixture of Mountain Dew and KY jelly <laughs> in my mouth and I had to hold it there and then scream and let it drip into his mouth and he gargles it as he's <laughs> screaming. But, you know, that's something to take a look at just for the disgusting factor. But we did a short with Adam Green called Driving Lessons. And he is a driving instructor. And I am his student as Michael Myers with the mask on. And uh, it's, it's pretty funny, just the, uh, the, the things that happen in that piece. And it was, it was fun to be Michael, but I can't claim it as official because it wasn't a movie. It wasn't a Halloween movie. But. Okay, if you're back tomorrow, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about your uh, uh, working relationship with Adam then, if that's okay, and we'll get on to the, the Hatchet movies in, uh, in more detail. Okay, any, any further questions uh, from the audience? One, one just there, yeah. Okay, uh, what was it like working on the upcoming Death House movie with all the legends of horror? Yeah, Death House, it's... Uh something we just shot in April in Philadelphia in an amazing location uh, called Holmesburg Prison. Uh, there, there aren't too many real historical buildings like you have here, so many everywhere, amazing buildings from the 1800s and stuff. You don't really find that in the States. But this one was fairly old and it, it was a prison that's not used anymore. And we shot the film Death House there. And um, it's got pretty much anyone that's associated with horror in it. It's, they kind of term it the expendables of horror, but I don't think they should do that because that's misleading. <clears throat> to me, that would mean that there's a bunch of us that are known for horror characters throughout the movie. But it is not that. It's I. <clears throat> my character is kind of throughout the movie, but most of the other horror uh, people are cameos, which is great too. I mean, they play amazing characters and stuff. But I think it, it's a little misleading to term it the Expendables of horror. But that being said, it's uh, the the director is a very talented guy, <clears throat> Harrison Smith, and he. He is making the feel of the film so 
interesting. Uh, even in the trailer that you can see online, it's really a, a cool premise and there's some really good performances in it. And, uh, my character is uh, not a nice guy. I know you thought it might be, but um, no, I'm a really horrible person. But, uh, you know, got all my friends in the movie and that, that's, that makes it a lot of fun. And I think it's going to be a lot better than people expect. So I'm excited about it. When, when can we expect to see that then, Kate? I'm not sure when it's coming out, but I mean, it's currently in the editing process. So. Okay, I'm sure we'll hear plenty more about that. Okay, anyone else in the audience? Any further questions? Yeah, one just to hear you. Hi, Ken, nice yeah. to meet you. Um, so, obviously, we've discussed the fact that you're iconically known for playing Jason Voorhees, but obviously you have been a stuntman and an actor in many movies. I just wondered what has been your best movie experience over the years? Wow, there's, I mean, there's so many fun, you know, characters that I've played, and, you know, I love playing the bad guy, don't get me wrong, but it's always nice, any actor will tell you they like to be challenged with something different and that's what Adam Green did with the Hatchet movies with me playing Victor's father so that I could do some emotional scenes which I've always wanted to do because you know I don't know for me whenever I watch someone and if they're really emotional and crying if it's someone that doesn't look like they would normally cry for me it's more effective I don't know why so I always wanted to be able to, to prove I could do a scene like that and, uh, you know, got some good response from it. And uh, I've, lately I've done some comedies, and which is a lot of fun too, because I, I know you don't think so, but I'm a funny motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's fun to do comedy. It's just so completely different. I did a... Uh, a comedy about Bigfoot called Love in the Time of Monsters. And I play the, the head of the Bigfoot actors at a theme park. And Bigfoot shows up and starts killing us. So, uh, but it's a very funny movie. And uh, I did another one with John Schneider, who was known for playing Bo Duke on the Dukes of Hazard. And I used to work on that show as a stuntman uh, when I was, you know, not working as much as I wanted, but working enough to make a living. Uh, I was <clears throat> working, I was one of the second string, I would call, stunt people on Dukes of Hazard and on the Incredible Hulk TV show also. And uh, <clears throat> so I've known John since then. He wrote and directed a movie called Smothered which has a bunch of us horror people in it. Myself, Bill Mosley, R.A. Mihailov from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Don Shanks, who played uh, Michael in Halloween 5, maybe? Can't remember exactly. I think it's 4, I don't know. But, um, and we all play ourselves, basically, in the movie. And we are horror <coughs> icons that nobody gives a shit about anymore. Like we're at a horror convention, sitting at a table, and nobody comes up to us. And we're bitter and pissed off. And <clears throat> we get hired by a woman that owns a trailer park to haunt the trailer park for Halloween season, just to scare the guests. And so we jump at it since we're not getting paid to sign our names anymore. And while we're working at the trailer park, somebody starts killing us off one by one. And the killer is, of, of uh, us horror people, is a really pretty blonde girl with big tits. <laughs> <coughs> and she smothers people with her tits, so. <laughs> Hence the title of the movie. So it's very funny, and I think John Schneider is brilliant as a writer-director, and uh, 
there was a there was a scene since I'm playing myself now. At the end of the movie, I I've had kind of a hockey mask looking thing that I scare people with. And the killer, who we don't know who it is, has put super glue in my mask. And I put it on and then I can't get it off. So I start to panic. And I go to the girl <coughs> who is working there, who is the killer, but I don't know that yet. And I say, you gotta help me get this mask off. I can't get it off, it's glued on. So <clears throat> she says, well, just pour gas on it and it'll loosen the glue. And that doesn't work, but she's poured gas all over me. Then I, I, I don't remember exactly how, but I realize she's the killer. And I grab her gun. And the first time we did the take of me facing off with her, with my gun pointed at her, my dialogue was, or her dialogue was, go ahead and shoot, you'll just set yourself on fire because of the gas. And then we cut. And then Schneider comes over to me and says, I have an idea, but I want to run it by you. What if she said this? And I was like, wow, that is brilliant. So the next take, she says, go ahead and shoot. You'll just set yourself on fire. You should know something about that, shouldn't you, Kane? And I thought, holy shit, what one line makes you hate her even more and makes you sympathetic to me because of being burned? And uh, he, he would come up with stuff like that on the fly all the time, and it was just such a pleasure working with him in that capacity. Kate, you've made it clear that uh, it's, it's a dream job for you, playing brutes and monsters. Were you, were you a horror fan as a kid? I was, yeah. I mean, I loved all the universal monsters especially. I had all the models that I would put together, the mummy, the Frankenstein, Dracula, um, you know, Phantom of the Opera even. Uh, so I, I always liked that kind of stuff, and my favorite horror film of all time, which still remains as my favorite, uh, is The Exorcist. And what most of you don't realize, because you're not old enough to have seen it when it was in theaters, when it was first out, it was, people were terrified to even go to the theater because of everything that was in the news. You know, people were saying they were becoming possessed in the theater. They were saying they were passing out, throwing up, just watching the movie. There was so much in the press that by the time you went to the theater, you were already scared. And I've never seen another movie have that impact on the public before you ever saw it. So that that's why that'll always remain as my um, favorite horror film. And... I think it still holds up, even though it's that old. It's still a pretty good movie now, even, with the visual effects and everything, but um, I'll always be a horror fan, and you know, I think there are people in horror that weren't horror fans before they became known for it, and now they pretend that they always were. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, Robert Englund, because that would be rude. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. But I think there are people, probably not him, but there are people that have become known in horror. And just to be fan-friendly, they pretend to have been horror fans all along. And I'm not sure if that was the case. But, I mean, that doesn't even mean that's a bad thing. But, you know, just, just be honest about it. I think actually Robert was a horror fan, if I remember now, but no. I just like giving him shit. <laughs> okay, now um, the the bad news is that for today we've uh, we've run out of time. We're on a pretty tight schedule, unfortunately. But the good news is that um, Mr. Holler will be back with us tomorrow, and as as we've we've suggested already, there's going to be plenty more to talk about. So uh, I'm off to uh, build up my muscles and practice my machete skills and I'll be taking this guy on again tomorrow. So for now, uh, can we thank Mr. Kane Hodder? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming in.